So as will be presented in a poster tonight, we'll be presenting long-term outcomes on the use of tab cell, a um, allogeneic off-the-shelf Epstein-Barr virus specific cytotoxic T lymphocyte product in patients with post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease after either allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant or solid organ transplant. And we actually enrolled 61 patients in this expanded access program that we can analyze for safety. And then there's a cohort of 26 true post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder patients on whom we, whom we are presenting efficacy data. So this is based on work that's gone back about 25 years by various groups, including Susan Prokop and Rick O'Reilly's group at Sloan Kettering. And they had previously established a mechanism by which they would transform lymphoblastoid cell lines with EBV and then expose T cells to these EBV transformed cells to generate out over time EBV or Epstein-Barr virus specific T cells for the purposes of adding these back in patients who had out of control EBV driven diseases, including lymphoproliferation. So that technology had been shown to be efficacious and safe in single center studies. So now this is under the auspices of the sponsor Atara using a very similar technology, but on a GMP commercializable scale to treat, as I said, both PTLD and other diseases, with the emphasis here being on the multicenter aspect of the trial, the long-term follow-up up to two years in some patients, demonstrating the safety and efficacy as registration studies using this same tab cell product in PTLD are getting underway. So the safety was reported on all 61 patients enrolled in the trial, which as I said, included PTLD, but a variety of patients with other EBV lymph, uh, excuse me, EBV driven diseases, such as leiomyosarcoma or EBV viremia in the setting of pediatric immunodeficiency. It proved to be incredibly safe during the infusion process. And there were really very few, I think it was 9%, grade three or higher, treatment related, um, treatment emergent SAEs, and really the main cause of um, AEs in more than 15% of patients were primarily fevers, fatigue, diarrhea, mild LFT abnormalities, and disease progression. But nicely, in those patients who responded, um, none of them died of EBV um, lymphoproliferative disease progression, and none of the other fatalities were considered treatment related. So that was the safety profile. And then in terms of efficacy, we report on the HSCT and solid organ transplant groups, and there were 12 and 14 in those groups respectively and we were able to track overall response rates as well as one and two year survivals. And that was also broken down, not just across the trial, but in terms of those who would have met eligibility for the registration studies. Before I give you that data, let me take a step back and mention who was eligible for this particular trial. So this was offered as an expanded access program as the inventory and the sites were getting up to speed for the registration studies. So looking at these patients in the PTLD or post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease cohort, the overwhelming majority of them, it was about two thirds in the stem cell transplant population, about one third in the solid organ transplant patients had ECOG scores of two or higher. These were pediatric and adult patients, so some of them had poor Lansky scores. So these were high-risk patients from a comorbidity point of view. And then if you refer back to a um, study by Shuey, C-H-O-U-E-T, who published a PTLD risk score, which helped stratify patients who had failed rituxan therapy for their PTLD, 
their ECOG status, age, and LDH were poor prognostic factors, and about 80% of the stem cell transplant group would have fallen into that high-risk profile. So I do want to mention that there were extremely high-risk patients, both on the HSCT and solid organ transplant group, that were coming into here. Even patients who had tremendous organ dysfunction that was related to the PTLD, so we felt reversible with successful therapy, were allowed on the trial. So in terms of responders, um, we stratified into two groups, the stem cell transplant and solid organ transplant, which has been looked at before in this manner, and the overall response rates, receiving therapy, which by the way is given in cycles of three infusions each, and even if after that first cycle at the evaluation period around day 35, there is a complete response, the patient always gets one more cycle of consolidation. So patients receive two million per meter square. Patients receive two million per kilogram um, on average uh, cells, tab cells, and they got a median of six infusions, so about two cycles. And as I said, even if they get a complete response, there's a consolidative cycle after that, and they receive at least three cycles if they have a partial response. And with that mode of dosing and that cycling, the overall response rates in the HSCT cohort for people who had failed either rituxan or rituxan plus cytotoxic chemotherapy was 50%, with an overall response rate in the solid organ transplant patients of above 80%. This led to one and two year overall survivals of about 60 and 83% respectively in those cohorts. These are in line with prior data that was accumulated earlier in this study and published in poster form as well, abstract form, but also with a larger single center experience from Sloan Kettering using this same technology. And one of the things that was nice is that the duration of response was quite prolonged. So in patients who initially had a response, the overall survival was between 86 and 100% at one and two years. Additionally, the same um, encouraging efficacy numbers bore out for the subset of patients who would otherwise be considered eligible now for the registration studies. So we have every reason to think that these results will be seen in the registration trials with potentially even a slightly more healthy group of individuals, although there is an expanded access protocol being offered by ATARA underneath this for patients who don't qualify. So I think there are some biologic questions in terms of how persistent are these cells? What is the mechanism of long-term disease control when you're using allogeneic, only partially HLA-matched cells? And then also, how can we predict who will respond to these therapies and who won't to either further improve them or help with choice of patients coming on? I think the other things are obviously the registration studies have been designed for commercialization so that there would be more widespread accessibility of these therapies to patients with PTLD. And then, if you recall, I had mentioned that there were 61 patients enrolled, and I'm reporting on 26 for efficacy with PTLD. So there's now analysis ongoing of those other patients who did not meet PTLD definition but have other diagnoses. And there also are trials ongoing outside the expanded access for those disease subgroups. You can imagine that PTLD is one EBV-driven cancer, but there also are EBV-positive um, nasopharyngeal cell carcinomas. So I think that the, some of the next steps in other diseases would include NPC, leiomyosarcoma, so we may have applicability outside of just PTLD. So one thing to emphasize is that TAB cell is expanded against antigens. There is no actual genetic engineering. So in terms of monitoring for 15 years, worrying about where is the new gen genetic in material being introduced into the chromosome, that is not a concern here. In addition, these are allogeneic off the shelf. So what I've experienced with some of my patients 
even as I'm giving them rituxan, which is still the first line of therapy for post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, I have the option to reach out to query with informed consent whether there is a relevant EBD, CTL, HLA match line in their bank so that if my patient is among the 50% who does not respond to their first line of therapy for PTLD, we can extremely rapidly access these for patient care. So I think the turnaround time, the incredibly well-tolerated infusion, the lack of um, cytokine release syndrome. There, was, there were three instances only in the post-allogeneic transplant setting of GVHD, but none of them were felt at this point in time to be directly treatment-related. Um, all of this safety profile, the ability to give these outpatients, make these an extremely attractive and timely mode of therapy for patients with these diseases. Thank <laughs> you.